episode of Green and Shaw. I'm here with my sidekick, Alden Erdemir, along with Lauren DeVito. Lauren, we are so fortunate to have you this week. Lauren is the editor-in-chief of CBD Health and Wellness Magazine, a highly renowned magazine in the cannabis area for health. She has a PhD in, um, from Cornell. Oh, no, that's your bachelor's, isn't it? Uh, Boston University in uh, neuroscience. And I've had some very nice conversations with Lauren in regard to the CBD industry. She's very, very knowledgeable as a writer and a research scientist. And um, I'm so happy to get started. And uh, um, I'll let you have a moment here, Alton, to tell them a little bit more about Green and Shy and what we do. And then Lauren will take off and the hour I guarantee you will go fast. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Lauren, for joining us. It's, uh, it's great to have you here with us. And if you're joining us for the first time on Green and Shy, we thank you for joining us. And Green and Shy, it's really a platform for opportunity. Opportunity for people to learn about the CBD and cannabis industry, learn about the trainings and the different education out there, learn how to get a job or start a career or a business, or if you're in the business, find referrals and resources, whether it's banking or recruiting or any of the things that are need, we want to be a resource to help you with those connections. And that's what it's all about. You know, the thought leadership to make sure that this industry grows so that we all can benefit. And not just on the medical side, on the business side, as well as everything that needs to be out there. There's a lot of knowledge that's here. And that's why it's important to us that great people like Lauren and leaders in the industry from New York join us because there's a lot of knowledge to share. So, you know, I really appreciate you being here with us. And Dan, I'll let you, you start it off with uh, the interview. Well, good. Um Lauren, I, I'm curious, you and I have talked before, but what interested you in science in the early days? And then from being interested in science and going on with your educational degrees, but then even moving into the cannabis industry, what attracted you to the CBD world? Sure, that's a great question. Um, and thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm really looking Pleasure. forward to our discussion tonight. Um, so yeah, I have a background in neuroscience. I did my PhD at Boston University in behavioral neuroscience. So I was studying different parts of the brain that contribute to memory. Um, I was also working on a preclinical model of schizophrenia. Um, I went on to do a postdoctoral fellowship in Toronto, um, Canada, where I was studying uh, neurogenesis, so the process by which new brain cells um, are created in adulthood, um, as well as studying a preclinical model of Alzheimer's. So after I had um, you know, been doing research for about nine, 10 years, I decided that I wanted to do a little bit, you know, do something a little bit different. So um, I've always loved writing and I uh, transitioned into the medical communications industry um, when I moved back to New York, which is where I'm from originally. Um, and basically, I worked at several different medical education companies, marketing companies, um, worked on a lot of materials for pharmaceutical companies and agencies. Um, over the past few years, I've been working um, as a freelancer. Um, uh, writing, you know, contributing to different publications, as well as still working in that kind of medical education realm and in startups, as well as nonprofits. Um, I had always been interested in the cannabis plant. Um, a lot of us come to this industry from, you know, originally our recreational use of cannabis, and then there are so many stories where, you know, people try it and they wake up the next morning and they're like huh i feel better <laughs> um and i don't know why but maybe i you know i had a really good night's sleep or i just feel more relaxed so i think you know that kind of anecdotally was certainly the case for me and it helped me with sleep um but it wasn't really until a couple years ago um and this certainly has to coincide with uh spreading legalization across the u.s i actually um was able to try CBD the first time, didn't really know what it was, um, had just started writing about um, cannabis research for certain publications. Um, and I took it and it really, really helped me um, with anxiety, with sleep. Um, I was just, you know, kind of floored by its effects um, and started using it, you know, uh, on a daily basis. I actually also was uh, diagnosed with endometriosis and had been using cannabis um, to treat symptoms before I even knew what I had. So it's um, very important for me um, as both a patient and a scientist to better understand 
all of the plants, the research behind it, the gaps that we need to fill, and especially educating people, consumers who are just interested in trying it for the first time, patients who really need the medicine, um, different kinds of organizations that, you know, especially for physician health, for, for nurses, uh, for their education, um, it's really important that people understand what the plant is and the potential it offers. So that's kind of what brought me in um, and has kept me working in this industry. So um, it's it's been a wonderful time. So, I mean, everybody's been just great in the industry about networking and collaborating and, and you know, really compassionate about what this plant can bring to so many people. You know, Lauren, I had another question. Stepping back in your, your resume to when you were with the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research, were they doing mm -hmm. any research there with the with cannabis plant or with uh, anything to do with CBD? I would be very curious because Michael's been very progressive and actually you might know John Rogers. John uh, wrote the foreword on Michael's book. Mm -hmm. that somebody mm -hmm. I've worked with on some research projects in the past. And uh, yeah, that's what that's, they had to say. Sure, that's a great question. Um, you know, I was there several years ago, and at the time, I don't believe that they were funding any research related to cannabinoids, or if they were, maybe I just was not aware of it. Um, but there's certainly a lot of educational um, webinars and articles written about using medical cannabis for Parkinson's disease, and I think that's an extremely um, great area to get into with um, looking at both the effects of CBD, um, cannabis, uh, all of the different compounds on how that affects Parkinson's disease because obviously we have no cure and we have no biomarker and we don't have any disease modifying um, therapies for Parkinson's that really work. We have a lot of medications that can really help with uh, certain symptoms, but there are still significant unmet needs in this area. And I think a lot of patients could benefit from using medical cannabis. And this is why in most um, you know, medical cannabis state programs, you do see um, Parkinson's um, included as a qualifying condition. What do you think going along with that? I, I know on the neuroscience side, and you know, a lot of people know about CBD, uh, but there's some, you know, new findings, a new trend. Uh, you know, last year it's kind of the terpenes. This year it's the yeah. the, the CBN, uh, the CBC, the CBGs. My really, you know, I'm, my claim is the, the CBG. You know, I'm really amazed with what they're finding out, especially on the neural side with Alzheimer's yeah. and all these different activations. I mean, what are you seeing on your side, on the scientific side? Of it? Because I think that there's a lot of exploration going on, exploring different, you know, uses for and potential, then I know Dan's an advocate. I know other countries are ahead of us, like Germany, you mentioned last show, Dan. And, you know, it'd be interesting to know your side, especially in New York, where it was more focused on medical because they aren't recreational legal. Um, yeah. Oh, just to clarify, New York um, only has a medical cannabis program. Right. So we do, right. you know, we do face some, some limitations. Um, yeah, in terms of CBG, it's actually interesting because in our um, latest issue of the magazine that just came out, we actually uh, featured Dr. Jim DeMesa of Emer Emerald Health Pharmaceuticals, and um, they are working with uh, compounds derived from both CBD and CBG. Um, that have been under research for about a decade. Uh, they came up, up with a portfolio of about 23 different compounds, and the first two that they've taken in for testing um, have been these two. And they're looking at CBD for multiple sclerosis, and they're also looking at this modified CBG for neurological conditions um, like Parkinson's. So these are, these are in trials, they're early stages. Um, it's very promising, the CBD compound itself or the one that it's based on. Um, they found some really interesting um, preclinical data um, on how this compound is affecting um, the myelin in the nerves that are damaged um, and stripped away in multiple sclerosis. So, you know, the thing about CBD is um, it's a really dirty molecule, um, dirty compound, I should say. Um, I once was interviewing a pharmacologist and, you know, he had worked both in academia, he 
work at the National Institute of Health, and he'd also worked, um, you know, uh, in research uh, on the industry side. And he said, you know, why why would a pharmaceutical company be interested in CBD alone? You know, if it's not modified in any way, it affects so many different pathways in the body. Um, you know, we know um, about CB1 and CB2, which are the sort of the canonical cannabinoid receptors and CBD and THC work on them a little bit differently. Um, but CBD also affects um, certain receptors that mediate pain, inflammation. Um, so every time you take CBD, you're activating or you're affecting a number of different systems in the body. So even within the different you know, cannabinoid compounds, whether it's CBN, CBG, or CBD itself, um, generally when, you know, a pharmaceutical company works on a particular compound, they want to know specific mechanism of action and specific target, whether it's one receptor or, or another. Um, and, you know, the way we have CBD right now, we really just, we, we don't know that when we take it. Um, so there's a lot of work to do, even in exploring within, um, you know, each of the different compounds. And a lot of the preclinical work has focused on exploring, um, at least some of the early work has um, been done on exploring, you know, the effects of a couple of different isolated compounds um, in, say, you know, an animal model or a petri dish and just seeing what happens there. And so I think it's really nice to have those comparative studies because we know that we get a different effect if we have like a full spectrum. So there's just so many areas that are rich um, and ready for research. Just, just touching on that point, and this is something I'm just curious about. I, I used to raise capital for early stage pharmaceuticals, you know, diabetes, all different types of, uh, you know, different types of companies that are amazing out there, bringing them to Dubai, the big healthcare organization out there. And, you know, with the clinical trials, I, I know with CBD and, and hemp and cannabis, it's a little bit different because it's kind of something that's treated like a drug and a food and a, a product mm -hmm. and a, you know, a commodity. But how is it with that testing? I know you mentioned a lot of testing and clinical trials. Is it at the stage where, you know, people can, can get involved and get into those human trials or what's the process like? It's got to be a little bit different since it's derived from plants. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's a complex issue, right? Because we have medical cannabis programs throughout the country, and some are more restrictive than others. But say you're a patient, uh, you have rheumatoid arthritis. You've been, you know, going to your dispensary, and you've been getting your flour, getting your tinctures, or whatever, because you have a card approved for your state. Um, but now there's um, a clinical trial that's investigating a particular compound for rheumatoid arthritis and maybe you want to participate in that. Maybe you want to take that drug once it's approved. Well, what about the, you know, at that point in time, maybe several years down the road, recreational cannabis will be legalized in your state as well. So I personally think it's very important to have all options available for patients because when it comes down to it, it's this is really a conversation uh, with them and their doctor. Um, and you know, I think that we need rigorous clinical trials to really assess these effects. You know, we have so much anecdotal evidence, but we don't have that hard data that we're used to using to, um, you know, evaluate a compound safety and efficacy. So I think there are some really interesting um, studies going on that are still in the earlier phases, but I think we can, as a benchmark, look to GW pharmaceuticals um, and, you know, the landmark approval of Epidiolex for severe epilepsy. And I know, you know, they're doing a lot of research as well. So um, it's early, <laughs> you know, a lot of people are getting in on the boom um, or have been working in cannabis in some way for a while, but we're in our infancy. Um, this is still the beginning of, you know, understanding the medicine and then understanding, you know, if it's FDA approved as a drug, that means one thing, but if it's FDA approved to be a supplement or something like that, um, in the past year, New York City actually put out a ban on CBD containing food and drinks, they can't be sold 
um, however you can go and buy a bottle of CBD and put it in, you know, whatever you have. So um, we need a lot of information from the FDA and they've asked for public comments on their dockets, but we're still waiting. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'm really so making progress though with the COAs and you know even the QR scans on on canned goods and all the things so you can see exactly the lab testing. Unfortunately, they're just lab testing for the CBD. They're not lab testing for other chemicals because you can have an amazing hemp plant, but if it's grown somewhere that was industrial ten years ago, you might also have mm -hmm. some chemicals. You know, but you know, that's something. Yeah, that's we always tell people um, that COA is so important. Um, you know, there was a big study um, a couple years ago looking at, you know, products that you can buy online and doing independent testing and showing that there's not a whole lot of CBD in that bottle. Um, and that's very concerning because it, it can, you know, be expensive and it's not giving people yeah. what they want. Um, but yeah, there should always be uh, lab results um, available on a website or, you know, through QR code so you can check the safety of your product. But, you know, in the best world, you would have those pesticides and other things listed um, and know where, you know, your plant was grown. Um, so you should definitely be, um, you know, diligent about that as a consumer, but it's not something everybody, you know, would think about. Absolutely. Lauren is a uh, research scientist and a medical writer and, and editor and publisher of a magazine in the field. Where do you think probably the greatest CBD research is being done medically in the world right now? Because it's being done all over to an extent, but I mean, I always hear yeah. Israel, but then there's other countries following behind Germany. I hear a lot of, and um, yeah, um, I have to say, obviously, um, for, there's so many um, leaders that have been doing this research from the beginning, Dr. Meshlam, of course, still doing incredible research. Um, you know, still discovering new compounds um, and isolating them. I think that, you know, Dr. Ethan Russo is amazing. Um, his papers were like my Bible. <laughs> I mean, it's just, they're incredible. Um, I can't even tell you how many times I've like copied and pasted that in as a reference because it's just, uh, his papers are, are, are really fantastic. But I would say that in general, you know, people are kind of popping up all over the place. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of American companies getting interested. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very, very intrigued about um, what's happening in Canada. Um, you know, now that they have a legalization, you know, Health Canada got flooded almost immediately with grant applications um, asking for funding for their research. So I think we're going to see a lot of great data um, come out of Canada. And, you know, um, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say there's a pattern of, you know, all the hot research is going on here. Um, but I would say that a lot of, um, <laughs> a lot of, um, you know, cannabis research is being published now in really high impact journals like nature and and you know a lot of other top tier um you know academic um journals which is kind of showing me the excitement that the rest of the field is kind of kind of feeling now so that's definitely really promising to see have you worked with any scientists that are doing any work with CRISPR or cas9 and genetic splicing and genetic manipulation um, no, I have not. Um, that wasn't really my genetics is something I did kind of work on, but not really quite at that level. So I, you know, don't work with any scientists or haven't. Um, but yeah, for sure, that's enabling us to um, create cannabinoids from different kinds of, of organisms. So, um, you know, there's definitely a concern and an interest there in the industry to scale up production. Um, as quickly as possible, of course, and, you know, there's the uh, growing involved, and I don't know all the details on the, on the, on the, um, the farming side of the industry, but it, it takes a long time, um, you know, to go from seed to sale, and there is definitely interest in looking at other types of biosynthesis for um, cannabinoids. And you know, some of these genetic techniques may allow us to do that. Um, another issue now is we were talking about the minor cannabinoids. Is there 
um, you know, names such that they actually appear in, in very low percentages in the plant, and that makes it even more difficult um, to extract them out and to get them up to the concentration level that you'd want to sell them at. So definitely looking at, you know, methods that would enable that um, would definitely be um, something uh, very helpful for people. I think so. I was, I was talking to a research scientist today that's from New Zealand who happens to be working for a Canadian company doing research in that area. That's why I prompted it. I hadn't really thought they were using anything with, with uh, manipulation such as CRISPR or Cas9 in this field until today. But I'm, I'm anxious to hear that they are. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And he was talking about making some unique properties that don't exist today by using that. And, and I just, when you start Start doing gene manipulation, though it's a whole different world, as you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there's um, many different, um, you know, sides of the conversation. On you know, a lot of people who are, are traditional growers and have been, you know, using cannabis for a long time and see it as you know, plant from the ground. We use the whole plant. Um, I mean, I'd always be um, happy with people kind of. Um, messing around with it and um, trying to make it a little bit different. But we do that for, with medicines all the time. A lot of um, pharmaceuticals we have now um, were based on plant compounds. Um, you know, I know it, it, it's, a, it, it's a tricky subject because it really depends on um, where you started your journey with the plant um, and sort of your um, interest in, in creating these kinds of um, targeted compounds for therapeutics. But like I say, I think we need to have just access to all of that for, for different people's needs. Great. I'll ask you this on a little, little, oh, little upper note, uh, Lauren. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of resources on the East Coast. I know we were talking earlier. It <laughs> sounds like you guys are doing that, leading the way, providing opportunities like we are here in Chicago with Green Shy. Why don't, you, why don't you touch base on some of that? I know you mentioned about the association as well as your magazine and all the different things that you guys do. I mean, it'd be good to learn kind of some of the things you guys have over there because it seems like a good support system. Absolutely. Um, you know, before I joined MACE, I was working sort of as a freelancer. And then when I joined the team as a writer, I really felt like, Oh, wow. Okay. They know what they're doing. <laughs> um, our CEO, Celeste Miranda, is incredible. She's been in marketing for a long time. She knows the cannabis industry well. She's also a patient. Um, she has MS and she uses the CBD. So I think there's just a lot of passion um, and empathy there for, for patients. And we're really focused on education. So as I mentioned, we have um, a few different publications um, within the MACE Media Group. We also have have the CBD expos as well as um, extraction expos where they're basically like small conferences where we have um, you know vendors come and booths and then we also have uh, a panel series where different industry leaders in, on the business side on the pharmaceutical side um, on you know the medical side come and you know discuss a topic answer people's questions um, so those are really informative events um, we also have the CBDIA Association. So this is a business association, um, and it's really meant to be a place where people can come together uh, for networking, for collaboration, for support. Um, this is really about helping people out in the industry, um, helping new businesses get started, what you need maybe from a marketing and product sell perspective. Um, it's a really great group. Um, the um, Dr. Mesa, Jim DeMesa that I mentioned, um, who's at Emerald Health Pharmaceuticals is actually on our board um, as well. So we do have a lot of uh, physicians as well as other, um, you know, business uh, associates. What have you guys, been, oh, go ahead, Dan. I was just gonna say when it comes to physicians, What's your, what's your position on actual doctors, mainstream physicians being able to better understand the CBD world? And I find, I read an article not long ago, which I actually published on my LinkedIn site, which was that only really 20% of the, the physicians in the mainstream understand cannabis and CBD to any great extent. Yeah, I'd be surprised if it's actually that much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> 
a lot of articles, a lot of surveys have shown that even in states like, you know, Colorado, where, you know, full recreational has been available for quite some time, physicians are very hesitant because they were never taught this in medical school. Um, they were never taught what the endocannabinoid system was. Um, I often love the fact that you know, even through my neuroscience and psychology um, undergraduate, and not until I even started graduate school had I ever heard of anandamide. Um, I find that completely ridiculous, considering that I was getting an education in neuroscience, and they left out this really, really important system. Um, so I think um, continuing medical education, any classes that physicians can take, um, to uh, better equip themselves. There are a slew of new um, online courses. We actually offer them as part of the CBD Expos. You can get uh, live classes. Um, and now we have, uh, due to COVID cancellations, we have the classes online as well. So I really would urge physicians to educate themselves. Um, if they don't have time to read the literature, I mean, who really does when you're so busy? Um, definitely try to take a course and really try to get yourself up to speed. Um, we work with a lot of doctors who, you know, have interesting stories of how they stumbled into cannabis. You know, um, one one physician kind of wanted to retire and then took his wife in, she had an illness, she wanted to try it, they started talking and all of a sudden he had a job. So, you know, people come in from all different, you know, kind of ways. So there are definite experts in cannabis medicine now on the medical side, people that, you know, we can connect you within um, CBDIA, but there's so much ground to cover still and physicians really need to get up to speed. Um, you know, it's a little different when we'll will have FDA um, approved therapies because the company takes on a lot of the burden on educating physicians about the drug, about the disease. Um, but, you know, for now, for their patients that are taking medical cannabis or even CBD, I mean, we encourage patients to talk to their doctor about CBD and not just think, oh, it's no big deal. Um, CBD is generally pretty safe, but we do know that it does have a lot of interactions with other medications. It's kind of known as a great fruit effect, um, but you need to be aware of it because it's going to affect the metabolism of your other, other medications. Where are so, some of the interactions that are the most prominent, uh, Lauren, that you're aware of? So there are some antifungals, um, cardiovascular medications. Um, there's a lot of different categories, but it's the uh, cytochrome P450 pathway, um, the family of enzymes that um, cannabis actually is broken down by, but then inhibits. So it'll make the other drugs in your system either work differently or stay in your body longer. So it's definitely um, important to mention that um, to your physician so they know that you're taking it. A lot of people will kind of maybe they'll shrug their shoulders if they don't really, you know, think cannabis uh, or CBD is anything more than, you know. Kind of a trend but i think it's it's important to to consider that is a very very important actually you know, <laughs> i've been in the space for a while we've had multiple people talk to it i've had multiple sponsors i'm associated with the cbd company mm -hmm. and that's the first time i've heard about you know the, the side effects really working about it everyone else makes it seem like it's something you can take like a vitamin c you know and then it but it has a lot better effects and it really is something that uh, your body needs because of that endocannabinoid system. I mean, every living thing has one. Why wouldn't you need something to support that, right? But yeah. it, it's really interesting that, you know, I didn't know that that, that mm -hmm. kind of effect happened. You know, obviously, whether it's alcohol or anything, you should consult your doctor. But right. the fact that it might let your medicine stay longer, that could really lead to some, some buildup there and some potential overdoses, if not, uh, you know, maybe not something that extreme, but. Yeah, I don't, <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be, I don't, I don't think it'd be anything like that. I mean, all the evidence we have, you know, for the most part suggests that, you know, the side effects may be 
um, dizziness, tired, you know, just feeling a little um, out of it, depending on the dose you took too. So that's um, a really important point is that we don't have guidelines on dosage right now. Everybody kind of has to do trial and error. Um, it can be frustrating for a lot of new users um, that they may not know, you know, where to start or where to go. Um, all we have is start low and go slow, which, um, you know, people have been saying for a long time, but it, it is important not to overdo it. Um, and also recognize that it's probably okay to raise it a little bit, but um, yeah, it's, it's challenging because uh, cannabinoids are lipophilic, um, which basically means they love fat. Um, so everything you do during the day or your lifestyle will affect how, you know, CBD, um, you know, how it affects you that day. So um, there's actually a study on the food effect. Um, so basically in the study, they looked at, you know, what happens if someone just takes CBD on an empty stomach um, after they fasted versus had like a hefty meal that was full of fat. And you do find that the absorption rate goes up. Um, there's more uh, CBD available to you in the body if you paired it with something fatty. Um, so that's something, you know, important to take into effect, um, how much you slept the night before, what other medications you're taking, not only for the drug drug interactions, but just, you know, when there's a couple different drugs moving around in your body. Um, and when you take those, all of those factors influence um, the dosage. So it's, you know, important to uh, start out, you know, playing around with it, but don't get discouraged if you don't feel anything. Um, you know, as much as we say, you know, promote CBD and all of that, it, it may not be for everyone. I mean, you may not get that optimal effect um, or it just may take a while. There's a lot of trying new products um, to see which one you like, which is fun. And that's what's so great about so many different players coming into the industry. There's such a variety of methods now. I mean, we have beverages, we have edibles, we have, you know, you can still smoke CBD flour, you can vape it. Um, we have topicals and patches. So, you know, if you find that you're just trying a method um, that's not really working for you, try something else. You know, if it's, if it's a targeted pain, if it's an acute pain, like say, you know, you have some wrist pain, maybe a topical will work better on your wrist than taking a capsule. You know, like I said, everybody's different, but you never really know what's going to be the best for you unless you try out um, a bunch of different things. Absolutely. I would agree with It's a little that. bit harder, though, because there's no psychoactive effect. You know, with THC, if you have you know, two times, right? don't go yeah. low and slow, you get punished. As soon as it, uh, you know, breaks down to 11-hydroxy THC and you have too much yeah. of it in your system and you might have ate another handful because you didn't feel anything, right, right. you get punished. But with CBD, yeah. it's more psychoactive. You really only know based off of, you know, if your symptoms kind of go away or not. And I think a lot of people are discouraged. I've heard multiple stories of people with good products. It's yeah. like, oh, it didn't work for me. It right. didn't work for me, as if they right. don't have an endocannabinoid system. Right? <laughs> but it's really, I mean, I took a nice, uh, you know, bud tending course from Leafly just because sure. I wanted to learn everything, you know, sure, I knew sure. on the side. Yeah. But it's more about what you want to feel, what you be, every person's going to have a different effect. So it, yeah. it has got to be a tricky, there is no take to uh, 200 milligrams of Tylenol. It's, maybe it's 60 for me and maybe it's two for you, Lauren. <laughs> Right. And maybe you have to do it a couple times a day instead of, you know, all at once. Or maybe yeah. if you're just looking for something to help you sleep, you just take that right before you go to sleep. Um, I think um, you reminded me, I forget who said this the other day, um, but a good way to try to tell is to look back maybe a week or two before you started and think, okay, am I not feeling anything or am I just feeling not as bad as I was feeling, like how much um, is this really affecting me? Um, I got to remember what it was like before. And I feel like for anxiety, that's something a little bit more obvious that people feel um, the difference. But yeah, absolutely. You got to really just figure out what's working for you and try different things. 
You know, I also think that all products are not created equal from the grower perspective all the way through the process. No. Because I found that, <laughs> excuse me, I found that um, with specific types of CBD oil that I've taken, mm -hmm. the ones that taste more like the cannabis and not flavored, I tend to find a better benefit from them that are basically cold pressed, almost like olive oil from a live plant. And I've tried mm -hmm. everything. And I mean, I probably had 40 or 50 different kinds of CBD oh, wow. tinctures. And yeah. I've found a couple that I think are superior. I'm not going to bring them up online tonight, but there's sure. a big, big difference in how things are processed, grown. And, and we get an awful lot of hype in the CBD world. And I think yeah. Some of it's way overhyped today mm -hmm. on, on what we get. And a lot of the things, when you see these small CBD companies that are popping up, they're buying from a process that might be supplying 150 or 500 other companies with the same product. And they use, yeah. this, you know, they're just trying to spin it 50 different ways. Yeah, no, that's definitely true. Um, what you had first mentioned was um, possibly the difference between isolate and full spectrum. So, yeah. um, you know, there's this idea that um, all of the cannabinoids together and the terpenes and the flavonoids, every, all the compounds in the hemp or cannabis plant, however you want to call it, um, when, that, when all of those are included in what's usually called a full spectrum product, you will see greater benefits because of what's called the entourage effect. Yes. Um, yeah, so that term um, is fairly uh, common now, but it really just goes down to show you that they're all affecting you know, different systems a little bit differently. Um, each cultivar is going to have different ratios as well of different terpenes and different cannabinoids. So that obviously comes down to the genetics of the plant and how they were bred, but that may be why um, you feel, you know, greater benefits from that versus isolate. Um, you know, every, again, everybody's different um, for sure, but I also agree with your point about, um, you know, some people just jumping in uh, because they see an opportunity. Um, a lot of people are just People start trying things just because it's in the news, just because it's popular and, and people want to go out and get in. Oh, there's CBD in this, you know, drink or something like I, you know, I want to have that and maybe not understand why they want to have that or what it's going to give them. And so I think some brands are, are definitely taking advantage of that um, and I agree. make something flashy. Um, so it's tough. I mean, consumers really need to spend a lot of time on websites um, or in stores, you know, I've had a lot of experiences where I kind of play dumb and I'll see, I'll see um, a package and it'll say, you know, CBD, blah, 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 um, with terpenes. And I was like, oh, great. You know, and I'll, I'll, I'll ask anyone who's there, like, which terpenes are in here? And they're like, I don't know. <laughs> and why would they know? I mean, it's not listed, um, but there's more than one kind of terpene. And, um, you know, it, Every different product um, has different information on it. So it's, um, it's difficult right now because people need to be educated and then they need to spend the time doing the research. So um, that, that is certainly very tricky. No, that's definitely something that's a good point because that cold press, I know we've had a couple of people like Kipker and stuff that do that, right, Dan? And you're getting a lot more into that as opposed to, and, and maybe you know more about this, it'd be good to know what, what your favorite process is because there's a lot of groups out there that are just doing it the old fashioned way and then adding terpenes in back then. So it's still right, technically right. past the test and shows it, but are they from cannabinoids or are they from, are they getting their pining from pine? Or, you know, I always look for lemonine and I'm going to butcher it, but the pepper bee, what is it, uh, chlorophyllin or whatever it is, you know, <laughs> yeah, those are yeah, the two right. I like because it's anti inflammatory. Yeah. Sure, like sure, sure. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I'm a little bit out of loss because, um, you know, I have been out of state and I've, I've shopped at different dispensaries, but being in a state that's not fully wrecked, I don't have as much of an opportunity mm -hmm. to look at all these different packages and compare. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't know, depending on, you know, the company, what kind of information they want to disclose on their website or on their packaging. Um, I think that it's, it's just difficult to, to kind of guess. <laughs> we mm -hmm. have a lot of guesswork in the industry, unfortunately, um, with a lack of standardizations and regulations. 
Um, we're not really sure what's in that product. Um, that's why I think it's nice um, when you are in a legal state, um, you know, that you have fully rec and you have a lot more people immersing themselves in the industry that can answer those kinds of questions that, you know, unfortunately, even sometimes at, at medical dispensaries, you know, people don't know. Um, for example, I'm, I'm a patient in New York and um, I just think it's crazy. You know, the consultations that I've gotten have been very short, um, although some people have been very knowledgeable, but, you know, I went to a dispensary near me and picked up a product, had a great conversation with the pharmacist there, went home and realized they never told me it was an alcohol-based tincture. And every time I took it, it just inflamed my mouth. <laughs> and I'm like, you really need to tell people um, what to expect because like you were saying that um, full spectrum hemp oil um, can taste a little like, you know, wheat grassy and, and not everybody likes that. And that could be, you know, you know, a little off-putting if people don't know what they're getting. Um, sometimes it's a little uh, difficult to mask that um, people will try different flavors and things like that. Some people love it. Um, it I prefer it's not just, to have It's mask. something that maybe you like that. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. How about you? Do you feel that way? I do full spectrum and I do cold pressed only, no other process. And I do it from live where they're processing live hemp in a cold press. They keep it fresh and do it immediately. And the people yeah. I work with have been educated in Israel pretty much and they're doing okay. it here in the United States and they have really strong ties to the scientific community there. And I think there's a big difference on what we get. And I've, I can, I've got four or five bottles laying out here on my counter. I can tell you that they're all different. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we do um, a bit of uh, product reviews for the magazine, both online and in print. Um, and, you know, there's so many aspects that we review on it on, you know, product alone. It's kind of the, the same specs that you would, you know, usually look at, you know, what's the branding like, but, you know, what's the price point, all of that. And then, you know, how would how would you feel if you know it, it tasted like this or you know uh, do you like coconut based oils or something like that? Right. Um, they are all so different, and I found that for me because I experience a lot of uh, chronic widespread pain that edibles work very well. But I don't want to have to take something sugary all the time, so I found that mints can be really helpful. Or um, again, I don't I don't mind the the taste of uh, the hemp or the cannabis oil so i'll Me just either. do you know, a sublingual <laughs> or anything like that so yeah a lot of people don't like taking edibles i think it's a little different with cbd versus cbd and thc right. um but again even medicinally um if you do have pain and you know you're working a really long day and you can't be intoxicated from THC then maybe you know try some CBD during the day I think that's drawn a lot of people in um, it's not intoxicating so you can take it whenever you need to um, unless the dosage is super high and then you're probably going to be tired but um, yeah I think there's just there's a lot of benefit to um, combining CBD um, and also having CBD on its own you know, Lauren, another question I have is I know people that are manufacturing topicals, and I think that's another area where things are so different. And it comes mm -hmm. down to basically the processing side, but I'm working with a number of companies right now that are using nanoparticles because of the, right. the changes. And I'm wondering if you've had any experience with nanoparticles from where you sat, and if you could mm -hmm. comment on that to any extent, and how you see that progressing in the market or not progressing as I think it will, but I'd be curious mm -hmm. to hear your thoughts. Sure. Um, I haven't had um, personal experience, but I, I have seen a lot of news about them coming out in nano emulsions and things like that. I think what people are trying to really get at is increasing the bioavailability of CBD, um, increasing the absorption, um, because like I said before, it's fat loving. So you're going to get different effects depending on you know the type of food you eat, your body builds, uh, things like that. So trying to get that those cannabinoids um, in your system um, and working instead of just, you know, getting, um, you know, taking a while to be broken down is, is really important. And I, you know, I always talk about dosage because I feel like it's one of the, you know, key areas that we need to work on 
um, oh, yeah, I do a lot more um, studies in, but I would say any technique, whether it's nano emulsions, nanotechnology, anything that gets us closer to um, better understanding um, how uh, the compounds are distributed through the body, being able to measure different levels at different time points, which is very tricky. Um, all of that is, is fantastic and um, definitely is needed. I think that the nano stuff is great. I mean, I, I wrestled Big Ten in college. I'm mm. getting old, I guess you could say. And, you know, my joints are starting to, to crink. Uh, yeah. you know, I'm not young like Dan or anything like that. And you know, I, I put handfuls. And it's, it's interesting because the, the, the aura stuff, I can see dosing, but I never think of it. Like, it feels, it smells amazing. It does great. work. You know, I put it all over my knee, sometimes the lower back and the knee pit, because obviously it's about absorbing in it. You know, people just put it directly on the spot and really you kind of want your local receptors too, your, 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 your soft spots or whatever you want to call them, you know, your pits. And, you know, I never think about it with cream. I just slap yeah. it on like it's big sure. paper rub and I'm just, maybe I'm wasting some or anything like that, but it does work <laughs> because, you know, there's a, certain level that has to be below to get through that epidermis on that absorption level that you need to make a difference. A lot mm -hmm. of people you're just pushing on lotion and your skin's going to look nice or maybe it's going to help, you know, the, 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 the immediate acute, like you're putting on some kind of menthol cream or something, but it's not going to get to the main issue and into your bloodstream unless it's you know, passing through that membrane. I, I yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. No, I, I was just going to make a quick comment on nanoparticles. I've had a number of creams and, and topicals that use nanoparticles and then others that have and I've had some that are menthols and have mm. the, like icy hot yeah. and I, I find the ones with the nanoparticles I have to use less okay. and I get a greater benefit that's my personal experience with mm -hmm. maybe using I, I probably had 20 or 30 different ones wow tried on joints or just muscle pain great you've definitely been more adventurous than I have I think it's great um yeah, the, the thing with topicals and creams is, yeah, I mean, dosage is just kind of all over the place there. Um, we really just, we don't know. And I often think about when I put topicals on at night, um, you know, how quickly is this going to get absorbed? Is this going to end up in my, my sheets because, you know, I get clung to or when should I put it on? You know, there's so many different questions that if you're just putting on like a basic aloe vera, you're like, oh, put it on, go to bed. Don't even think about that. Um, so that, that's definitely something that's, um, important and should be addressed. Another thing is a lot of people are moving in, um, from the beauty space and you've got lots of CBD, you know, infused, um, you know, lotions and, and things like that. I think it's important to, um, for consumers to know the difference between hemp oil and cannabinoids and CBD and, and hemp seeds. So sometimes people will use hemp seed oil and hemp seed is great. I mean, it's, it, it has um, great nutrients, um, really a lot of uh, great stuff in there, but are you gonna get the same cannabinoids you would get if they use the plant? Well, no. So that's just something that you should be aware of because you know right now the price points of these products can be quite high. So you don't necessarily want to spend money on something that's not going to provide you um, with the full benefits. Like if you were to go to a dispensary and maybe ask um, about a certain topical product, and hopefully they would know if it was seed or or you know oil. But I you know I noticed that at even you know now CVS and Duane Reads and all of those pharmacies are carrying you know hemp products um look at those ingredients <laughs> make sure you know what you're buying if it's something like 25 or 30 dollars for a small lotion container make sure that um you're not getting ripped off absolutely i'm looking forward to the day when we can go out and buy fresh hemp at the farmer's market and come home and juice yeah. <laughs> put it in with the celery and, the, and everything else i throw in yeah 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 Lauren, yeah, so that's just great to, because the taste is not great, but it's the benefits are definitely there. I have a few friends in California that tell me it's great experience. It just tastes bad. Huh. Lauren, yeah. before we run out of time here, yeah. I know you have a, a great publication, your great magazine. <laughs> what kind of things do you cover on it? Maybe share with our audience, you know, what kind of things I know we have a lot of business enthusiasts. <laughs> what kind of content are you looking for as well? Because I know a lot of these people are looking to to get into some nice collaborations and different avenues as well, get their stories out there. I mean, obviously we have a lot of connections to share with you as well, but it'd be great to 
kind of learn the angle you have there on that magazine. Yeah, absolutely. So um, as I mentioned before, um, we have CBD health and wellness that does focus on the CBD industry, but we also cover, you know, other cannabinoids as well. Um, so we do, we cover a lot of, um, you know, research, uh, clinical trials, but we also cover lifestyles. So we'll talk about beauty products. Um, we cover regulation because that's just such a huge part of the industry right now. Uh, different trends, opinions, um, technology. We kind of cover uh, quite a broad range on our blog. Um, we also share press releases that are sent to us from different companies. Um, we share guest uh, blog posts as well. Um, as long as the information is educational and not promotional, we do have several different op opportunities for promotion in the magazine and through our other partnerships but we really want the um, blog to stay informative and educational. Um, so that's one way to contribute. We also have the print magazine, which is bi-monthly. We're always looking for guest submissions. Um, those uh, articles tend to be a little bit longer. Most of them um, kind of, uh, we try to tailor to the theme of that um, bi-monthly um, issue. But, you know, we're, we're always um, open to uh, just getting different perspectives. Um, so, yeah, so the one that is coming up, um, our deadline is closing next week. But we're going to be, like I said, talking about uh, different conditions in the body and um, how different people use CBD or cannabinoids or, um, you know, looking at some research behind different conditions. So, yeah, so we have, we have that magazine. We also have Terpenes and Testing, as well as Extraction Magazine, and those are a little bit more um, technical on the actual extraction processes and technology. Um, terpenes and Testing obviously covers a lot in terpenes, but it, it does also... Um, you know, discuss uh, different techniques and also research in, in cannabis. We also have our uh, CBD expos, as I mentioned, and the CBDIA um, association. So please feel- Where are the expos normally held, Lauren? Um, they usually have one in different parts of the country. So we'll have like Southeast in Florida, we'll have a Midwest in Chicago where you guys are. Um, there's also um, some extraction events. There are different partnership events that occur. Um, so there's usually something going on every month. So it, it's pretty busy and there's a lot of opportunities for panel speakers to come. So there's just, there's just a lot of areas where people can collaborate and I always welcome people to connect with me on LinkedIn, write a message on, you know, the submission area on the blog, and we get back to you very quickly. We're on top of our email. Um, and like I said, our, our CEO is just wonderful. She's just always looking to connect with people and learn from them and connect to each other. So there's definitely a lot of areas for collaboration. Lauren, your three publications are very, very educational. I can attest to it because I read them. But Thank I you. would like... Uh, if possible, uh, mm -hmm. talk to our viewers who are watching tonight on how they can subscribe to these publications in case they're interested. And we'll pass that on afterwards, but since they're listening, it'd be great if you could share that. Sure, absolutely. So our publications are all bi-monthly, um, terpenes and testing and extraction magazine paired together, CBD health and wellness on its own, and we have an upcoming um, Hemp Farmer magazine that's going to debut. Um, so you can go to um, either cbdhealthandwellness.net and there is a subscribe um, button in the top navigation and you can just go over there and you can either get the magazine as a digital version or a print. Um, so you can sign up um, and once you do, you can download it. Um, and you'll have the digital version or you'll get the issue in the mail. Lauren, on another note, I'm looking for some insider information. Can you tell us a little bit about New York? I mean, it's different. You're not <laughs> recreational, you know, oh, but okay. you're medical, you have CBD. And that's something that I'm interested. I mean, I go to Florida, uh, mm -hmm. my girlfriend's mother lives down there and it's not legal recreationally, but 
they have CBD in almost every single shop right. down there, right. you know, and, and everyone seems to sell. So what, what's New York like, and what do you anticipate to say? And it doesn't have to be what's New York over the last three months. It's kind of been a different world, no matter where you are in the world. Yeah. But maybe let's rewind to what New York's like three months ago. Sure. Um, well, I, I find the medical program here to be pretty restricted. Um, you can only purchase uh, capsules, tinctures, a vape pen. Um, you can't get flour. Uh, really? You can't get edibles. So, yeah. So it is fairly restrictive and there's only a handful of uh, dispensaries in the New York City area. So I find it a little bit limiting. Um, you know, every state is different. Um, you know, when I went to Colorado and I went to a, a med rep dispensary, I talked to the, the general manager and she's telling, telling me about these patient programs and all the savings. And, you know, I, I was so naive, but the first time I went here, I asked them about a program and they're like, what are you talking about? Um, <laughs> so it's, it's a little bit frustrating when, when you know what other people have available to them, but I'm still incredibly grateful. Um, they recently um, decriminalized the use. And after seeing data that showed how people of color are disproportionately arrested and imprisoned for cannabis possession, um, the mayor decided um, informally, I guess, to tell police not to kind of enforce, I guess. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, it's, I mean, you can, you can see it everywhere. You know, people will very openly smoke. Um, City stunk I, is what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I feel like it's, um, you know, it's, not as strict as maybe some other places, but um, to me, if it's not fully legal, it's not legal because it's, you know, not everybody has access to it. And, you know, while we're in the middle of the, the protests going on right now, cannabis legalization is really a social justice issue. It's about making sure that everybody who needs access to the plant has access, that we end these arrests that are only affecting uh, one population, um, you know, there's been such a difficult um, kind of traumatic history of cannabis in this country and was just wrapped up on the war on drugs, which we know has failed terribly. Um, and, you know, people really need to make this a prioritization. I think Chicago's done a wonderful job with their um, policy package that really encourages funding and people of color to get into business. Um, in the cannabis industry, um, but we need to do more. We need to go farther. Um, we need this on the federal level. You know, we have so many banking restrictions and, and other issues with, you know, what we can say in social media, what we can't, who can say this and who can say that. Um, it's still a sticky area. So I would say in general, New York is pretty laid back, but if you're a patient here, you don't have a ton of options, unfortunately. I think it'll change within a year, but I'm, I'm looking forward to that because New York is such a great state. And I think I, I'm just surprised they haven't gotten to it yet. I, I know Illinois, they wanted the money. Yeah. so They didn't bother to go ahead and put it on the ballot. Our legislature just passed the bill so they can. I know. I was just. I, was I good thought, for us. That's incredible. Yeah. And, you know, I was in Chicago in uh, mid-January and uh, talking to friends and they were like, yep, January 1st, <laughs> we got it. And every other you know, even Maine, I don't even know what's going on in New England. Like they legalized it and then it takes forever to actually get dispensaries open. Um, but yeah, you guys have been operating since the first day of the year. So that's um, incredible. I know medical have, uh, patients, so there were shortages initially with flour and other things right, for right. the yeah. recreational patients. But I think when, Alton, when you agree that they're catching up, I, I don't think the shortages are nearly what they were earlier in the year. It's not that they're catching up. It's just that they're they're doing different methods. I think a lot of the COVID stuff that, you know, making it harder to get also stopped it down. I know that they've been really good at making sure the medical, that's one thing that really causes sort of, yeah. I think there's some kind of stipulation where because of the, there has to be a certain amount to be able to supply to the medical people at all times. It left out. I know I went to, you know, Sunnyside Dispensary in Wrigleyville here. We, there was a line. I didn't even see the line. There was literally the buildings on this side of the road 
but there's a building where people wait across the street. That is exactly the dispensary that I saw. I right? was there <laughs> so I earlier in. in the year. I, and I uh, yeah, I saw, and it was January, so it's freezing. Yeah. Right. It took, I it walk took a couple in and, hours. And, but, you know, I have I have yeah. another friend to say, oh yeah, they have this and that. And I just go on the recreational and I say, okay, you're gonna wait in line, but all we have available are, you know, diamond this and one yeah, pre-roll. Yeah. I'm like, I have more than that in my what? pocket. Why would I wait in line? <laughs> <laughs> but so, but no, you you actually did. We always ask a, a last thought, and I think you covered it really well with your last <laughs> statement because we do need this reform, whether it's for social equity, social justice banking i mean all the looting every one of the dispensaries in chicago got looted imagine if you can have you know one of the services that we have access to like banking or you know credit card processing that's legal you know all these type of things that are going to help not to have all that cash on hand i mean can you imagine any other business doing that it's just unthinkable it's man it's It's crazy the government wants so much control they'd actually get their money faster if they didn't do it this way (laughs) but um, unfortunately that is the time that we have. Like we, like Dan said, it's going to go fast. You know, we can probably talk for <laughs> two hours on this, but you know, everyone that watched tonight, we appreciate you and your support. And Lauren, thank you so much for all the knowledge you shared. It was great. Dan, it was a pleasure with you as well. You too. And Lauren, if there's one last thing you wanted to say, what would it be for closing out this evening that you think is important people should know? Oh, goodness. Uh, hard to think of just one. Um, But I would say whether you are interested in CBD, cannabis, if you're a patient, if you're not a patient, whoever you are, you need to know about the endocannabinoid system. (laughs) Thank you. And I I think that is so important. (laughs) And then sequence in the human DNA to basically coincide with it. Yes. You need to know what it is. You need to, even if you never try it or you're not interested, just find out what this fundamental system is in the body and learn a little bit about cannabis history because it's so fascinating. And we've got on our heels the psychedelic revolution coming, and that is all about plant-based medicine. So none of this is going away, and we really need to embrace it. Absolutely. My last question to you is, would you come <laughs> to Chicago and join us when we do a panel discussion in the medical field, and I bring in some doctors and some folks in the uh, DNA sequencing area along with people that are sequencing the plants? I think you'd be a great panelist for that particular evening. And then you'd also be able to interview all the people and have an article that you're yeah. <laughs> later. Exactly. So, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much for the Lauren, interview. thank you so much. Alton and I had a great time interviewing you. It was very informative. I learned a lot tonight. And, and thank you so much. And I look forward to when we can meet in person sometime. Absolutely. Thank Ciao you all. For now. Have a thank wonderful you. evening. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. And thank you for joining us. Bye-bye. Until next week.